All right, folks, hold on to your hats because today we're taking a wild ride through history and genetics. Buckle up. We're diving deep into the world of ancient DNA to unravel the secrets of the Sarmatians. The Sarmatians. Now, they might not be a household name like, say, the Romans. Definitely not the Romans, but they were a force to be reckoned with in their own right. A nomadic group who once held sway over vast stretches of the Eurasian steppe. They've been called the forgotten people, often overshadowed in the history books by their more famous neighbor. But trust me, their story is anything but forgettable. And thanks to cutting-edge genetic sequencing, we're finally starting to piece together the puzzle of their origins, migrations, and lasting legacy. It's like opening a time capsule buried deep in our DNA. So before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's set the stage for our listeners who might be hearing about the Sarmatians for the first time. Who exactly are we talking about? Well, imagine this. It's sometime between the 4th and 2nd centuries BCE, and somewhere in the vast expanse of the Eurasian steppe. We're talking present-day Russia and Central Asia. Serious history here. Absolutely. A group with roots in the southern Ural region emerges. These are the Sarmatians. Skilled horsemen, fierce warriors, and masters of the open plains. And they weren't content just staying put, were they? Not at all. Over time, they began expanding their territory, venturing westward into the Pontic Steppe, a sea of grass stretching as far as the eye can see. And I bet they ran into some other nomadic groups along the way, right? Like the Scythians? You got it. The Scythians were the dominant power in the Pontic Steppe at the time, but the Sarmatians, they were a force to be reckoned with. They eventually displaced the Scythians, becoming major players on the Eurasian steppe by the Iron Age. Wow. Talk about a changing of the guard. But it's not just their military prowess that makes them so interesting. They also left behind these tantalizing clues about their language and cultural connections. Right. Ancient texts suggest they spoke in northern Iranian language, which gives us a glimpse into their origins and how far their influence might have spread. But for this deep dive, we're focusing on a particular branch of the Sarmatians, the ones who ended up in the Carpathian Basin, which is mostly modern-day Hungary and the surrounding areas. Right, because their journey didn't end on the steppes, did it? Yeah. So how did they go from those vast open plains to settling in the heart of Europe? That's where the real detective work begins. By the first century CE, Sarmatian groups had already established a presence in the eastern Carpathian foothills, think present-day Romania. They used it as a strategic stepping stone on their westward journey. So they were gradually making their way across the continent. Exactly. And in the early decades CE, a specific group of Sarmatians known as the Ayigiges crossed the Carpathians and entered the Carpathian Basin, drawn to the fertile lands of the danube tissa interfluve basically, the area between two major rivers that acted like ancient highways. Prime real estate back then. You bet. Over time, their influence grew, and they eventually dominated much of the Great Hungarian Plain. The previous inhabitants, mainly Celts and remaining Scythian groups, likely came under their control during this period. So they went from nomadic warriors to, like, powerful rulers. Did they trade in their horses for fancy feasts? Not quite. While archaeological evidence suggests they adopted farming practices and established settlements, they definitely held on to their warrior culture, especially when it came to their interactions with their new neighbors to the south. Oh, those warrior roots run deep. Speaking of their new neighbors, I bet the Sarmatians' growing power didn't go unnoticed by a little empire we like to call Rome. You're absolutely right. Initially, they maintained relatively peaceful relations, even engaging in trade and diplomacy, but as the Sarmatians grew stronger, things started to heat up. I can imagine. Rome wasn't exactly known for being hands-off when it came to their borders. Exactly. By the end of the first century CE, relations had soured, and by the second century CE, the Sarmatians had become a formidable force challenging Roman dominance in the Danube region. They even played a role in the famous Marcomannic Wars, a series of conflicts that pitted the Roman Empire against a coalition of Germanic tribes. So not exactly a group to be trifled with. Based on all this, it's easy to imagine the Sarmatians as this unified force sharing a common culture and genetic lineage across these vast distances. But is that really the case? That's where this new research comes in, and things get really, really interesting. They weren't just looking at where the Sarmatians ended up. They were digging into their DNA to unravel the complexities of their migrations and interactions with other groups. Okay, now we're talking. Let's get down to the nitty-gritty of this genetic deep dive. What exactly did the researchers do, and what did they find? So they analyzed 156 ancient genomes from burial sites across Hungary and Romania, dating from the 1st to the 5th century CE. 
That's a pretty significant sample size. Yeah. Enough to paint a more detailed picture of who these Sarmatians really were. Exactly. And the locations of these burial sites are crucial. Remember how we talked about those Carpathian foothills being a likely migration route? Well, the researchers included a specific group in their analysis, labeled Rousearm in the paper, who they believe represent the Sarmatians before they entered the Carpathian Basin. So it's like a snapshot of the Sarmatians on the move. We're catching them right in the middle of their westward journey. What did their DNA reveal about their connections to other groups? Well, first, they compared these Sarmatian genomes to existing genetic data from other ancient populations. They even went so far as to reanalyze data from 45 previously published steppe Sarmatian genomes. Talk about thorough. These researchers weren't messing around. They wanted to get the most complete picture possible. Absolutely. And this meticulous approach yielded some fascinating and surprising results. While their analysis confirmed that all Sarmatian groups ultimately originated in the East, probably the Ural region. Just as the historical record suggested. Exactly. But here's the surprise. The Sarmatians who ultimately settled in the Carpathian Basin, labeled Hunsarm in the study, didn't show the strongest genetic links to those Eastern Sarmatian groups. Wait, really? That's not what I expected. I thought they'd be a direct offshoot of those Eastern Sarmatians. It's a real head scratcher. Their DNA pointed more towards a connection with the Romanian Sarmatians, that Rousearm group we talked about, the ones in the Carpathian foothills. So it's like they weren't a direct offshoot of the Eastern Sarmatians, but rather this group that had already migrated west and potentially mixed with other populations along the way became the primary ancestors of the Carpathian Basin Sarmatians. Precisely. It suggests a more nuanced story of migration and interaction than previously thought. And believe it or not, it gets even more complex than that. Oh, don't tell me there are time travelers, too. My brain can only handle so much. Not quite time travel, but just as mind-blowing. The study uncovered evidence of multiple migration waves occurring within the broader Sarmatian period. So it wasn't just one mass movement of people, but rather a series of distinct groups arriving over time, almost like they were riding the wave of some ancient trend. You've got it. And this actually supports what archaeologists had suspected based on changes they observed in Sarmatian material culture, things like pottery styles and burial practices. There were hints of new groups entering the picture in the 2nd and 4th centuries CE, and now we have the genetic data to back it up. Those archaeologists were definitely onto something. Okay, this is getting good. So who were these later arrivals? Give me the details. Where did they come from, and what were they doing hanging out with the Sarmatians? Well, one wave seems to have originated in northern Europe, and this is where things get really interesting. Remember those Marcomannic Wars we mentioned earlier? The ones where the Sarmatians were battling the Romans? How could I forget? Rome's greatest frenemies. Yeah. But what do those wars have to do with these new arrivals? Well, the researchers suggest this influx of northern European genes could be directly related to the tumultuous events of that time. You're saying some of the people fighting against the Sarmatians might have ended up joining them. History is wild. It's certainly a possibility. Imagine the chaos of that period, prisoners of war being integrated into Sarmatian society, or perhaps entire groups switching sides or seeking refuge amongst the Sarmatians during those conflicts. It was a time of upheaval and shifting alliances. It really makes you question everything you thought you knew about these ancient groups. It wasn't just black and white, good versus evil. It was a whole lot more complicated than that. What about the other wave? You mentioned something about an East Asian connection. That's quite a distance from the steppes of Eastern Europe. Ah, yes. This is where we see the genetic signature of the steppes appearing even more strongly. This particular wave possessed a distinct East Asian ancestry, indicating a separate group migrated alongside the Sarmatians, potentially from as far as Central Asia. Okay, so let me get this straight. We've got Sarmatians moving west picking up influences and genes along the way, kind of like a nomadic snowball rolling across the steps. That's a great way to put it. And then on top of that, you've got even more Sarmatians showing up, plus groups from Northern Europe and Central Asia joining the party. It's more like a genetic mosaic than a straightforward family tree. It really highlights how those steps were like this dynamic crossroads of cultures, a place where groups weren't just clashing, but mixing and mingling over centuries, leaving their genetic mark on each other. It really challenges that old view of ancient groups as these separate, isolated entities. Like, we learn about the Romans and the Greeks and the Egyptians, and we tend to think of them in these neat little boxes. Right, like they were frozen in time. Exactly. But this genetic evidence is showing us that it was never that simple, was it? 
it was a whole lot messier and a lot more interesting. Absolutely. And speaking of messy and interesting, there's another layer to this story that really jumped out at me. Remember how history traditionally tells us the Sarmatians just disappeared after the Huns arrived in the 5th century CE? Right, like they were just wiped off the map, gone without a trace. Which, I mean, the Huns were a pretty big deal, right? They swept across Europe, changing the political landscape, striking fear into the hearts of empires. A force to be reckoned with, for sure. So... Mm -hmm. What happened? Did the Sarmatians just get absorbed into this new Hunnic Empire? Did they lose their identity entirely? Well, that's the thing. When we look at the genetic data from the Carpathian Basin after the Hunnic period, we see something remarkable. The Sarmatian genetic lineage persists. Hold on. Are you saying their DNA is still detectable centuries after the Huns arrived? Like, they didn't just vanish. They left a lasting mark on the genetic landscape. Exactly. It's like a genetic echo reverberating through generations, a subtle but undeniable sign that they were there. That's incredible. So they didn't just disappear. They integrated with the local populations, becoming part of the broader genetic tapestry of the region. Precisely. And it makes you wonder how many other vanished groups might have left these subtle genetic echoes, these whispers of their presence hidden in our DNA. It's like those historical mysteries where people are searching for lost cities or buried treasure, but sometimes the most valuable discoveries are the ones we make by looking inward at our own genetic code. I like that. It's a good reminder that history isn't just something we read about in books. It's encoded in our very being. But let's get back to the Sarmatians because there's another aspect of this study that I think our listeners will find particularly intriguing. It involves how those westward migrations might have actually played out on the ground, so to speak. Okay, you've got my attention. Give me the details. So remember how geneticists can trace ancestry through different parts of our DNA. Like we've got the Y chromosome passed down from fathers to sons and mitochondrial DNA passed down from mothers to their children. Right, like two parallel family trees, each telling a different part of the story. Yep. Exactly. And when the researchers analyzed the Y chromosome data from the Sarmatian period, they observed a dramatic shift, specifically a significant increase in the frequency of certain Y chromosome haplogroups. Think of these as distinct genetic markers that provide clues about a person's ancestry. And were these new haplogroups coming from, say, the steppes? Like, is this where we see that East Asian influence really showing up? You got it. They were associated with Central Asian populations, and their appearance aligns perfectly with those Sarmatian migrations. It's like a whole new branch suddenly appearing on the Y chromosome family tree. Which makes sense, given what we know about their movements across the steps. But I'm sensing a bet coming. Something about the mitochondrial DNA. You're sharp. Here's where it gets really interesting. When they looked at the mitochondrial DNA, the lineage passed down through women. They didn't see that same dramatic shift. So while there's a clear influx of genes from the step on the paternal side, the maternal side tells a different story. Exactly. And that discrepancy, it gets us thinking, what if those westward migrations, particularly the initial waves, were predominantly male-driven? So picture this. You've got these bands of Sarmatian warriors riding across the steppes, seeking their fortune, maybe even fleeing conflicts in their homelands. And they're not necessarily bringing their families along for the ride. It challenges those romantic notions of peaceful migrations, of families packing up their wagons and heading west for a better life. This was a different kind of movement, one driven by men, by ambition, by conflict, by the desire for something more. It really makes you wonder about the human stories behind these genetic shifts. Mm. Who were these men who left their mark on the DNA of generations to come? What drove them? What did they experience? And what happened when they arrived in these new lands? Did they integrate with local populations, perhaps taking wives from the communities they encountered along the way? These are questions that could fuel countless deep dives, countless hours of research and speculation. It's like we've opened one door, only to find a hallway filled with even more doors, each leading to new mysteries and deeper insights into our shared human past. But before we get ahead of ourselves, you mentioned earlier that the researchers stumbled upon another mystery, something completely unexpected. You can't just drop a bombshell like that and not elaborate. It's like we've stumbled upon a hidden passage in an ancient tomb, and now we can't resist the urge to see what lies beyond. What did the researchers uncover about those mysterious Iron Age individuals? You remember those individuals from the early Iron Age, labeled R-O-U-I-A in the study? Found in the Carpathian foothills, they predate the main influx of Sarmatians we've been discussing. Well, get this, 
Their DNA turned out to be strikingly similar to the steppe Sarmatians. No way. You mean, even before the Sarmatian migrations we've been talking about, there might have been movement westward from the Ural region, earlier than anyone suspected. We're talking about rewriting the history books here. It's a truly mind-boggling discovery, and it raises so many questions. Were these individuals part of an early wave of Sarmatian explorers venturing out centuries ahead of the main migrations? Or could they represent a link to an even older group? the Sumerians, who predate both the Scythians and Sarmatians in that region. It's like opening a door to a whole new chapter of history we barely knew existed. It really makes you wonder what other secrets are just waiting to be unlocked from the genetic record. Mm -hmm. So, like, the more we learn, the more we realize how much we don't know, which is both exciting and a little bit humbling, isn't it? Absolutely. And that's the beauty of this kind of research. It's constantly challenging our assumptions, pushing back the boundaries of our knowledge, and revealing a past that's far more complex and interconnected than we ever imagined. So if we take a step back and look at everything we've learned today about the Sarmatians, it's clear they're not just some footnote in Roman history, are they? Absolutely not. This research paints a far more nuanced and dynamic picture of who they were. Instead of this single homogenous group, we now see the Sarmatians as part of this incredible tapestry woven from multiple migrations, genetic mixing, and cultural exchanges over centuries. It really flips the script on how we think about ancient populations. It's like we thought we knew their story, but it turns out we were only seeing a small fragment of a much larger, more intricate picture. Exactly. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. As more ancient genomes are sequenced and analyzed, who knows what other surprises await? We might find traces of Sarmatian influence in unexpected places, uncover connections to other ancient groups, and further enrich our understanding of this pivotal period in human history. This deep dive has certainly given me a lot to ponder. I don't think I'll ever look at a historical timeline the same way again. And to our listeners, we'll leave you with this thought. What hidden chapters might your own genetic code reveal? What stories of migration, resilience, and cultural exchange are woven into your very being? Never underestimate the power of the past to illuminate the present and inspire us to explore the boundless mysteries that connect us all.